Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new edition of Low Code Cafe, episode 64. Uh, the episode today will be a lot about the uh, new release uh, that we are just about to, to launch today during this event, and uh, we will go through some of the major features uh, to demo. But before that, my name is Bogdan Licesco. I am the founder and CEO of Planton App. And for those of you that are new to this event, uh, know that it's something that we are doing every week. It's a community event, uh, so it's mostly focused around uh, techniques, uh, local techniques, how to develop things, showcasing new features, uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, sometimes we also have guest speakers, so if you have uh, good uh, ideas, good technical content to present, uh, we'd love to host you, so reach out to us. Uh, this uh, webinar is being uh, recorded and then you'll find all these uh, past events on our YouTube channel and it's a great source of learning because you can see various techniques from integrating with other local platforms from to building up uh, apps from scratch to integrating JavaScript libraries. So there's, there's a lot of very good uh, content in there. So make sure to visit and uh, subscribe as well. Okay, the agenda for today will uh, we'll start with the community updates with uh, Chad uh, Weiss, he's our uh, sales engineer, and then we'll get some community, uh, some uh, stories from the trenches with Del Werner, our head of support. And uh, finally, I will, uh, I will take most of the time to uh, show you uh, the features, the new features in the product, uh, demo, demo them to you, but also show you what's coming because we have, a, we have a major release coming up the next one. So stay tuned until the end. So Chad, if you want to bring it on. Hi, everyone. So could you jump to the, the next slide, please? Oh, perfect. So today, what I wanted to look at is uh, a few different things I've been reading recently. And maybe some of you are, are more aware of what CIOs have been going through with their, their kind of transition that, than I have been. But it, it, it was interesting to me about how fast a chief level, the, the C-level executive roles, um, can possibly change during something like a pandemic. Of course, there's going to be changes they go through regularly. But this seems to be a big shift in terms of, like, your job set used to be this, now it's this. A, a lot more stuff was added on. And that, that seems to be most apparent for CIOs from what, it, what I've been looking into. And we've, we've been seeing some of the, the similar shifts in different regions of software as well, we'll, we'll which what we'll get into as well. But the, the biggest thing that CIOs have seemed to have to shift from is that they used to be the, the business leader, the, the technical minded leader responsible for managing the IT, leveraging technology to create value within the business. and um, now, now what we're seeing more is they're having to be a digital innovator and an expert in strategy. And yes, they've always have to be an expert in strategy, but specifically now an expert in digital transformation strategies, because we've entered, not only have we, we entered the, the digital age many years ago, but we were kind of propelled into it even more rapidly with, with the pandemic coming on as, as many are, are aware and had to go through yourselves. And we, with, with low code coming into the play, it's good that we had a system like this because that has helped fill a lot of the, the demand we've had, mainly that, that shortage of developers, which is a very real piece. And there's actually a, another piece as well, which I do want to touch on in possibly another webinar topic, but there's also uh, being reported that there's a lack of, what was the, the specific term they used? a lack of confidence of the business from the IT departments. So that, that's something that was kind of, a, of an interest to me. And I think it all comes around the, the idea that there aren't enough resources to go around because CIOs have to manage the lack of resources, potential lack of funding as budgets are being stretched farther. And of course, lack of IT talent out there making sure that they can do more with, with what they have. And a lot of them have been developing a, a hybrid approach with low code and no code. And the reason why, this is something that actually makes a lot of sense. It's not so much something that's, I mean, it is a necessity now, but that's not really what I think is driving the, the true use behind it right now, is we've seen similar advances like this in different sectors. To think back, you know, 15, probably not even 15, even just 10 years ago for websites, it was mostly an IT or a developer related job. You would have to go in, even things like editing HTML, CSS, the themes and stuff, that was all a real hands-on effort. Now. Anybody can go and get a WordPress or a SharePoint site, Squarespace site. <laughs> Sorry, no SharePoint. But well, potentially if you want to have an internal site and you're already on Microsoft, you could get SharePoint too. But 
the idea is that we've seen those shifts. We've seen it in the CMS space. We've seen it in um, the actual Salesforce CRM management space. If we want to look at Salesforce specifically, you used to have, and, and when I first started at uh, DNN Corp a few years ago, we had somebody who was dedicated, certified by Salesforce to manage our Salesforce instance. With Salesforce Lightning coming out a year or two ago, probably four years now, virtually anybody can do that level of management with reasonable training and reasonable instructions, but it's no longer a critically specialized role like what a developer would be, which is a critical specialized role. There are these different people who can come in and do a lot of those extra advancements on top of it because the software has progressed to make itself easier and more drag and drop friendly. And we're seeing that in the, the developer space as well, which is helping take over a lot of that slack that we're seeing with the shortage of developers and lack of resources. Low code is mainly being used in a, a hybrid approach right now for the developers to help them accelerate and advance their creation of processes of critical business level applications. And then no code and uh, code optional elements are being used more at the IT business level for the, the, the smaller integration type apps that, that they might need to create along the way. So one thing we're also seeing too is with this type of a hybrid approach, whenever you Google low code, even though it's something that's out there that's very prominent and even tells you what it is in the name, the first things you're gonna see is what is low code? Why do I need it? How is it used? It's still very early in the market and there's gonna be a lot of different ways that it's changed. Potentially low code could be the solution overall and a good low code platform could have everything in it that you need. But we will see some of those adjustments and I'm, I'm actually quite interested to see what might be happening with the COO and the CFO counterparts as well along the way. Good deal. All right. Um, let's see if I can uh, move on to uh, our From the Trenches segment today. This is, um, and, and thank you, Chad. Um, our focus today on our webinar is um, the new release version 1.16 and uh, Bogdan is going to be talking a lot about the new features that are part of that. But I am also going to be talking about uh, some of the things that happened with the release that relates particularly to the support requests, either things that you identified, things that we identified, and just a quick demonstration of uh, some of those things that were addressed in this release. So the first one of those, uh, DNN 9.9 and 910, there were some issues that we had. Clients that loaded our, uh, our tokens module previous to uh, version 116 or the hotfix that came out at 115, uh, clients that were using and, and went to DNN 9 and DNN 9, oh, that's a typographic, 9.10.1, um, and uh, had issues with tokens, particularly around languages. There were some other issues, but if you had multiple languages loaded on your site, we we're seeing some, some oddness. So the hot fix for that is, uh, is available for 115 and it's built into 116. Um, there was another, uh, another thing that one of our clients identified for us having to do with user ID. So uh, when you use the user ID token, it uh, you can provide a default for it. And since I'm logged in here, it's showing me, it's evaluating uh, user user ID with a default of minus one is coming up three and user user ID is also three. Um, I'm going to open the same page in an incognito uh, window. And so since I'm not logged in, we see that uh, when we provide a default, it's showing as minus one. When we don't provide our default, uh, it, it's returned as blank. So this functionality of, of being able to do a default was uh, was not working in version 115. Uh, it was a it was a uh, issue that we um, uh, fixed in 116 and also hot fixed. So that's a um, that's one of the new small things that happened in in this release. Um, we, uh, there was a, a thing that we uh, found internally having to do with a, uh, with workflows. When you have a input parameter that was the same as the output parameter, there was an odd case where uh, when you called that from another workflow that you didn't get the result that you were expecting. So um, 
this is the this is the old version of it, and, and I'm just going to run this. I don't I don't think I'm going to dig in real deep on this, but um, these two values were being returned by the workflow we were calling, and uh, it should they should have been the same. Um, we fixed it in version one sixteen, and so now when you run that exact same workflow on a system that's got one sixteen loaded, we get the same result. So um, I, 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 I will dig in just a little bit on that and just kind of show you the workflow so that it makes sense to you. Uh, so we'll go back and look at workflows. And the workflow that was being called was this one. And it was just a very simple workflow that had an input that said, uh, it's inputting a parameter called echo. And uh, there were no steps in the middle and then on the output side we we're outputting echo and echo two and in both cases we we're just sending whatever was coming in coming out and <clears throat> um, so this was the case if you had something in input here and the same name output here um, it was it was not returning the value to when, when it was returning the value when you saved and tested and worked with it here uh, but it wasn't returning it to the the uh, calling workflow and uh, of course that's a problem so we've uh, we identified the problem we fixed it hopefully it didn't inconvenience any of you but uh, we we find things internally and fix them uh, a new feature that i wanted to touch on and this was uh, one that that was near and dear to the heart of one of our clients is um having to do with um what is it load entities sql we've got a new option that is clear before loading so this is the old behavior. I made a workflow to demonstrate this. I'm just gonna uh, open it up uh, real quickly. I have two load entities SQL, and we're gonna look at these two. Uh, the one on this on the left is about set up just to, be, to display this information well. And uh, these two on the right uh, are, are just displaying the information. So we'll, we'll see it here. The, the guts of what we're gonna see, the different is here in load entity SQL. So let's take a look at these. This is a load entity SQL action. And uh, it's doing a SQL select, select the user ID where the user ID is one, and it's putting it into the entity. In the same way, the second one is a slightly different SQL statement that said, uh, select user ID from users where user ID is less than three. So this is going to get three more uh, user IDs and put it into the same entity. And so this is the way it was working before. When we save and test this and run it, it has no input parameters. On the outputs ID, we see that we have four items in the entity and it contains user IDs one, one, two, and three. So the second uh, load SQL, uh, the second load entity SQL didn't clear the entity, it added to the entity. And that's been the behavior all along. I'm outputting it in the, in the second way here with, as JSON with uh, the same thing, user ID one, one, two, and three. So displaying the same thing in two different ways. So on to the new feature then, uh, we have this new checkbox that is clear before loading. And if you check this option, your entities will be loaded in a new empty list. So by doing this, uh, this second SQL is going to overwrite the entity list. And so when we save and test, we're just going to get one, two, three, one, two, three, user one, two, and three. So uh, just a small change, and it doesn't break anything because the default behavior is that this box remains unchecked. So if you've used this and you need it to add, uh, content into an entity you can you can uh, do that but if you need it to be initialized you can use clear before loading and you end up getting it, um, it just the content that you need um, the, the newer the newer content so that's um, a few fixes that were done uh, a new feature that was added as a result all this is a result of uh, support your requests and the things that we find internally being put through to development. There were nine others that were done. We're not gonna cover them all. And some of them uh, don't, uh, are, are not even, would not even be visible to you. They're really, some of them are very um, isolated to a, a single client, but uh, we we're, uh, had nine other fixes in this release. 
Um, this uh, I put in a plug for campfire. Those are that's Fridays at 10 a.m. Central and things that we we will be going into some of these in uh, more in depth. And so uh, if you're if you're interested, watch for the uh, there's going to be a link. I'll post it here in a minute on the chat. Great. That's from the trenches today. And I will uh, stop my share and ask Bogdan to jump in and start talking about all the other features that are built into version 116. Thanks, uh, thanks Dale, for the for the warm intro with the with some of the changes. So yes, we uh, we have a lot uh, a lot to cover today. Uh, I will uh, I will present you a bit about the uh, 116 release and know that it's already released. We haven't made the the let's say the uh, newsletter and the change log published yet. But uh, if you if you go to the plant app instance and you go to the update section, you'll already see the update button. And if you create new instances on uh, on uh, uh, on, from the Plant Lab console, they will already start with uh, with 116. So uh, the build is released; it's out there. Uh, just the marketing part uh, needs to be done. Cool. Uh, there are a couple of major features, and I, I've mentioned uh, uh, this in the past. Today, I will get to show them in uh, in uh, great uh, detail. Uh, the bigger the bigger features, I would say, are the, the Facebook and Google login. We added them to our uh, existing OpenID connector, uh, so they still use the the OpenID and the OAuth uh, mechanism. And I will show you how to configure that, how it works, how it looks, uh, and and uh, dig more into what's coming for them as well. Uh, the other big feature uh, for for many years we had this ability to open forms in pop-ups which is uh, which is widely used uh, uh, even with the built-in functionality but also with the custom forms uh, that we see out there it's very widely used uh, we've added the same functionality also for uh, grids or for listings so now you can you can uh, start a page that has those uh, listing hidden and open it in pop-up and again uh, i'll get to show that in a bit uh, we also have a new uh, trigger that fires on error, and I think that's uh, that's very good uh, when when uh, you know things break in real life, things break, and you want to be the first one to find out that things broke before customers do. So that's why we've implemented this trigger that uh, can simply it has a very simple configuration. Uh, it can be as simple as sending an email when the error fires, or as complex as uh, opening tickets or or triggering various processes. So uh, these are the, the major additions, but of course we, we've also done a lot of uh, enhancements and adjustments. And I'll say the biggest chunk of it, uh, what I put here on the screen is about dependencies. You know, dependencies uh, are always a, a point of focus because they fall also in the security uh, area. New, new uh, versions of the libraries always come with security fixes as well but also in the performance and also, of course, in the, in the compatibilities and so on. So we've already adopted a process uh, with some, uh, some of the libraries to, to update with every release, you know, like uh, the DNN, for example, we test against newer versions on every release, on the latest version of every release. Angular, we are, we, are up, we are upgrading it on every release, so we get more and more libraries, making sure they get updated uh, each time. Uh, we've also uh, properly uh, tested the, the compatibility with 9.10.1. Uh, we haven't found anything, uh, so uh, um, every, uh, just small issues that were addressed. So now it's uh, it's guaranteed to work. So make sure to to grab it. I think it's a very good release. Uh, and then uh, there is the what I call the developer experience area, which is uh, making more e making it more easy to debug things. You know to see to see uh, uh, what, what's the data at, 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 uh, at some stages in the process. And this is something that we are just getting started. We, we added uh, small things like being able to see the action number in workflows, you know? So then you, if you have an error, you know exactly what action throw that, that error you know, uh, in the logs. So that makes it much easier. And of course, uh, uh, we've added a new way to navigate the dependency tree of the entities. Uh, so it, now it becomes really, really useful. There's also uh, many bug fixes as uh, Dale suggested as well. And uh, the change log should already be in the product. So if you are upgrading from, from 115, let's say, you'll see the, the log already in the product and we'll soon publish it on, on uh, the website as well. 
Cool. Um, I will reserve more time towards the end to, to discuss about what's coming because I think that's also uh, something very interesting as well. But now I will, I will jump uh, directly to the demo. And I, I guess as I go, feel free to, to put questions uh, in the Q&A or in the chat window and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll answer them uh, for this specific uh, uh, feature set. Awesome. So the first feature that I'm going to show uh, is the uh, OpenID or the Google and Facebook uh, Connect. So uh, I'm just going into incognito mode. So I, I see the, the login screens. And uh, you'll notice here that I have two uh, login buttons. Of course, this can be highly customizable, uh, highly customized from a UI CSS perspective. And we'll get to that in a bit as well. So basically uh, here, just to show you the, the, let's say the user experience first is what you expect from, uh, from any site. I mean, here logged me, it logged me in automatically because uh, I was already uh, logged in earlier. Uh, let's see if uh, Facebook does the same. Yeah, so it redirects me to, to Facebook and Facebook uh, knows that I pre-authenticated this application before the call, but uh, otherwise uh, it would have just shown me a, uh, a authorization screen. And I guess uh, what, what I can do and what I will do now when I show, do, I show you the admin, I will delete my user so we can repeat this experience to see the, uh, let's say the first time users log in as well. Okay, so uh, going back to, to, to the, uh, to the uh, instance, um, the OpenID configuration uh, currently is not uh, embedded in the app builder. That's something that we are going to do in the future, but it's here in the, in the sidebar and it takes you to this uh, configuration screen. There are quite a few settings and uh, I'm, I'm not also a OpenID expert, so I'll just go through the uh, high level uh, settings. Uh, basically, there's the CSS that I mentioned. So this will allow you to customize those buttons to look uh, to look the way uh, you want to match them with your website and so on. Uh, of course, there's this uh, enable authentication that this is if I disable this, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, let's uh, see this button, these two buttons will be gone. You know, so that that's uh, that's the setting that disables it all. Okay. After which you can add uh, providers, and then uh, with each provider you have a bunch of settings to to configure. Uh, note that uh, it's not just for uh, Facebook and Google. So we we've used this provider with other authentication providers as well, such as uh, Okta, uh, Azure AD, uh, Cognito, AWS Cognito. So uh, we we've we've used it with a number of different providers, but. Of course, for each provider, there's something different, something specific. So then um, we have to add new settings of new APIs or adjust it a bit for those to work. And that's what we've been doing in this uh, release. Uh, let me refresh not to save that. So that's what we've been doing in this release with uh, Google and Facebook. And I've pre-configured this, uh, these two here. So let's take a look first at the um, Google configuration. <clears throat> So in case you are not familiar, uh, there is a uh, uh, Google Cloud uh, console. And here in the console is where you create this, uh, this kind of application. So in particular, I think we'll find this, uh, this uh, configuration that we need to do on the Google Cloud side. We'll find it in the API and services. And there's mainly two things that need to be configured. One is the OAuth screen. You know, so there's a, there's a couple of settings uh, here, uh, test users. So this is first to have the, the screen. And then the second one is, is going over credentials. And here, uh, let's see here, we have, uh, we have to, to define the site that can connect to, to, uh, to the, this, uh, let's say, OAuth screen. So here, for example, you see it's, uh, it's the instance that I'm uh, demoing from. And then this is the URL, and then this is where it, the login page lives. You know? So you have to define some URLs. And of course, these are the things that you need to put in the uh, co connector configuration. So, <clears throat> so basically uh, here, this, uh, this information was picked up from there. One of the powerful things here 
is that you can uh, you can uh, define what happens when user authorized you know? so beside authorizing the user uh, inside the platform which uh, which uh, uh, is a built-in feature you can do any actions that you want you know so maybe you want to set up a, a, a complex profile or you want to set up a, a invoicing uh, billing details and so on you know you can you can do any workflow that you want when these people log in you know? so this is uh, this opens uh, flexibility to do any custom scenarios uh, people have. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> one, uh, let's see. Uh, there are also some advanced settings in here that I would not be able to, to explain in much detail. They are more like, uh, let's say, uh, specific to the protocol, you know? So you'll see things like claims, you'll see things like tokens. No, so these are specific to the to the open id uh, protocol there are there are specific terms similarly with uh, facebook uh, and also i think let's see uh, uh, there is a provider type here which i forgot to explain so right now there's uh, there's two let's say generic providers open id and uh, all two no, so you you notice how Google uh, with Google we use the Open ID uh, provider, but then with uh, with Facebook we had to go all out because this is uh, this is what they provide. So similarly, there is a uh, Facebook developer uh, where you create an account, and then uh, the next thing you'll create a new app, and then with the new app you'd probably create a consumer app to enable a Facebook uh, login, and then after which you'll get to these uh, settings that I'm about to show. So again, as, as Google, we need an app ID, an app secret that we will copy paste in the other place. Then we'll need to provide some uh, the app domains from which people can, uh, can uh, log in. Um, there's a few more settings here under uh, Facebook login. So if we look a bit at them here, you have to enable uh, the client or auth login. Uh, and this one, this first, the first two have to be enabled to to be able to log in, and then uh, some other uh, metadata that again I think uh, it's more uh, it's more in depth uh, for developers. And again, this is the uh, login page, the registration page uh, where people will be returned after login. So going back here, we can look at the provider configuration. You see the exact uh, same settings, more or less, and then the 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 URLs are different. Of course, this uh, being a different provider, you know. So this being uh, OpenID doesn't have some settings, whereas this one being OAuth has a few different uh, settings according to the standard to the standard of OAuth. So uh, again, you see uh, you see the uh, client ID, so the app ID, the secret keys that I showed you, uh, and then uh, I think this refers uh, to the to the permissions that to, that uh, the application needs from Facebook, the data that it needs. So in the authorization screen, it will say uh, the, this app requires access to your email and your public profile. You know? um, and then uh, some uh, again some uh, very uh, take uh, thing takey things uh, regard regarding the claims and the mappings of of uh, of attributes. And again, as before, you can define the workflow that happens when people log in from Facebook. You know? So again, run uh, all those uh, custom um, custom uh, actions, custom business logic. Uh, note that there is uh, there is also some hints uh, at the bottom, and this URL gets uh, replaced dynamically, so it will uh, you can just copy paste it from here to use it uh, to use it for uh, copy pasting back in 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 Google Cloud Console or in the uh, Facebook Developer uh, area. <clears throat> so uh, this is pretty much the configuration experience. Uh, as you saw, uh, let me go back to the incognito screen a bit. Uh, as you saw, uh, this uses more like the, the let's say, the built-in login form in DNN, and we have it on our roadmap to, to change this to also work in the form builder, because I think that's when it will, it will unlock even more possibilities of, of how you can build, design these kind of forms, and uh, how you can, um, you can make it look and feel. 
Uh, let's uh, let's try before moving on to the next one. Let me try to clear up the users to force. Uh, uh, let's clear out this uh, this uh, Facebook first to see what happens uh, on the registration side as well. So I will just make sure this is uh, uh, permanently deleted, and then let's try let's try logging in with Facebook again. Ah, so probably uh, I think maybe because I kept this window open, so maybe I will close this. And then uh, let me try again to uh, delete this uh, Facebook one. And then uh, delete it. Permanently delete, of course. And let's uh, let's uh, give it another try in incognito. So of course now I'll be required to log in. Oh, I'm not required. Okay, so maybe I have more than uh, one incognito window open, so it saved my Facebook login. Anyways, the experience is what we all know that uh, login with Facebook and Google is. There's nothing new there. Cool. So let's see if there are uh, any questions so far regarding the Facebook and Google login. Uh, no, not so far, but again, there's a uh, question and answer or from the chat, either one, if you have any questions. And I, I wondered on that um, whether you needed to log out of Facebook might be the issue. Uh, could be, yeah, but I was in incognito, and I think one of my other windows here is ah. probably also incognito, and I know that incognito windows share also share uh, share the login. So, got it. Yeah, I don't think that's the the important part because it works standard it's standard for every website. We all do it a couple of times per day. <laughs> we do have one question about uh, where was the starting point on the DNN persona bar? Where is it? Oh, yeah, the administration screen lives here in the OpenID Connect, uh, so it's the last item. This gets created automatically when you install the provider. So this uh, page and this button gets created automatically. So the pro provider, this would be an extra a, a selection on the update screen. You have to choose to install this. Yes, this is correct. And uh, so if we go to the configuration screen here in the update screen, it's where you'll see it. probably I already have it installed here. So let's, uh, let's look for it. Uh, should be here. Okay, it's, uh, it's not here, I will check. Uh, otherwise, it will be in, in the add-on screen, and I think I know what the issue is. It's on our roadmap. Some of the add-ons are not here yet, and that's also scheduled for 117 to, to clear it up. Oh, this one it is in particular, yeah, so it's here. Not sure why it's not appearing at this stuff. I will check with, uh, with the guys. Great. Okay, so... Um, Let's uh, let's uh, move to the next one, and also you you'll notice that uh, uh, I mean this one is from the last release, but you you notice that the uh, uh, change log is already here for one sixteen, so uh, uh, we we could go through it over here as well. But I will go back to my slides where I have it uh, more structured. So then uh, the next uh, the next thing that I want to show a very cool feature uh, along that's been uh, been long waited for. Uh, which is the ability to, to open uh, grids in uh, pop-ups. So let me start quickly by creating a, uh, an entity. Uh, let's, uh, let's call this, uh, what would be a cool name for it? Let's call it webinar and webinars. So let's, uh, let's give it a name. Uh, let's give it maybe a date, just so, so we have some data. Uh, we, we can use a uh, date and time. Okay, uh, let's just uh, switch to this uh, name and that's all I will do for now. I just want to have the page generated for me. So going back to the front end, of course, we have the uh, webinars page. We have, uh, we have the form to add a couple of them. So let's do uh, low code campfire. That's coming up this Friday. Okay, and then 
And then the idea is that, uh, you know, by default, this grid is always open, but sometimes when you build more complex pages, you want maybe to push a button and have the grid uh, be displayed or displayed in a pop-up. And that's, uh, that's exactly what, uh, what we've built. Uh, so, uh, the, and the configuration is quite simple and the help text are there to make it uh, ridiculously easy to configure. And we've also copied a lot from action form. No, so we have this uh, display mode that's initially visible, same as, as the form. And then you have two more options. You can open it in a pop-up or you can open it uh, manually. By manually, it means it opens in line on the page uh, when we uh, invoke the JavaScript code that will open it. So if I choose on pop-up, you'll see again, the help text will tell me exactly the, the uh, uh, JavaScript code that I need to run. So I'll copy this in my clipboard, save this, refresh. So what happens now? You see there is no grid here. My grid is gone. But if I open the uh, console, if I run this piece of code in the uh, browser console, there it is. It comes, uh, it comes back up. No? And uh, there similarly, so maybe what I should do, let me duplicate this so I keep, uh, I keep the listing, uh, the configuration open so we can, we can test various settings while looking at the settings at the same time. Of course, I could have given it a, 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 a title, you know, so webinars. I could have given it a different way. So let's say 800 pixels or using a percentage, percentage so any, any measurement, any CSS measurement. And I will also copy this one because uh, the next stage I want to also close it. Actually, I will need to open it first. So let me keep this one, save, go back, refresh. Okay, so now again, the listing is not visible, but I can open it with this uh, function. And now you see also the title, the width uh, has been set. So it's, it's exactly what I want. And then if I wanted to close this again through, through a uh, uh, JavaScript, I can copy paste this one, you know, copy paste it here and now it's closed. You know? Of course, uh, nobody would run, uh, would run JavaScript like that on a, on a web page. So usually uh, people will do that from buttons, for example, you know, or from even from, from custom JavaScript that runs behind the scenes, you know, like maybe checking something every couple of seconds and if something happens, pop up the grid, you know, things like that. So for our example here, let's, uh, let's add a form. Let's manually add a form to the page. And in that form, we'll add a button that opens this listing. So you can also see the, uh, let's say, a more realistic experience of using this feature. <clears throat> so I'm adding a button and then I will put it uh, maybe here uh, just under the title. Let me close this uh, noisy thing at the bottom. I will start uh, with a blank form. Let's, uh, let's give this uh, a title, the form. Uh, let's give the form a title so we know to, to easily find it in the list of modules from the page. And then of course we add a button. We call this button, uh, let's say, show, um, show uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, maybe we do some uh, layouting to bring it right from the start. Uh, things like that. And then on this button, of course, we have uh, all these uh, settings and also the bind expressions. The bind expression is where we can put custom JavaScript here on the on-click uh, handler. So basically, I will need to open the form. So I will call this one. And sorry, and an important thing, uh, if if we don't return anything from this on click handler by default action form does a page refresh you know so then we have to return false to to tell action form that we don't need it to do a page refresh we we haven't actually submitted anything or did anything on the submit we want to block it here so we just return false so uh let me let me save this and let's look what we have so far i will open yet another window here let me close this uh, this edit mode. So now we have a button, you know, that says "Show Upcoming Webinars." I click it, and I see the upcoming webinars. 
so nice and smooth and then now you can build much richer UI. You could have done this in the past, but much difficult. Now it's very easy, as you seem to build this kind of uh, UI. And then you could also have like multiple buttons, and you, so you could have ten different uh, listings on the page. So it's a much better uh, way to organize information when you have lots of data. Cool. There's there's a lot more to it. I will just uh, I will just uh, maybe maybe before uh, before uh, going to the more advanced stuff. There's also the ability to show it in line. You know? So let's uh, let's copy this function instead. I will save this one. I will go back to the form. This is my form. And instead of opening in the pop-up, I will uh, I will uh, open it in line. You know? So uh, I will just change the function that's being called. And now if I refresh, when I click this button, instead of popping up, it opens in line before. You know? So theoretically, you could even mimic tabs using buttons. So you could have buttons or checkboxes or uh, drop downs. So you could have an action form, a one row action form here. And based on what you do, show, height, various grids. You know? So it creates a very, it creates new interesting patterns uh, for building pages. Okay, so yeah, uh, I, think, uh, I think I will stop here. But before that, I wanted to show some of the, uh, also the more, more, uh, more advanced settings. So um, am I in the right place? Uh, well, no, this is the right place. So these are, uh, these are just a couple of methods that you can get things done fast. But if you scroll uh, at the bottom of the, of the uh, general setting screens, here is the complete specification of all the APIs that are supported. There are, of course, uh, counterparts for hiding the grid. There's also a refresh method, you know, so very, very useful if you want to force a, a grid refresh from, let's say, a, a custom JavaScript on the page or from an action form. Again, this is, uh, this is very, uh, very useful. And there is another thing. There's also a, a model setting object here. So when you show the grid in pop-up, we use the bootstrap model which in fact accepts a lot more settings than the one we exposed. We just exposed the title and the width. But with this object, if you, if you go to the Bootstrap pop-up documentation, you could build, you could use any capabilities uh, out there. You know, for example, maybe you want to force people not to be able to escape or click outside to close the pop-up. Maybe you want it to stay there until they make a choice. You know? You'd use this, uh, this object to control that kind of more advanced behavior. Great. So I would say that uh, this is a very good feature. I just touch uh, from my imagination and from what I've seen, uh, just a, a few patterns, new patterns that I see, I see emerging. So uh, I would love to to hear if there are any any questions or feedback about this uh, this feature that I showed. Yeah, so far, there has been a comment about just being happy uh, with the additional login capabilities and. and just this is these are things that people have asked about for uh, before. Um, we do have a question on grids, though, about can we control the window sizing of the grid? So this was, uh, if you if you remember, let me find my way around. So this was here in the listing. It was uh, it was both the uh, let's move back to the pop up. It was both specified here, so it's eight hundred pixels. But as I was just mentioning, you, you can also control it if you if you use this uh, overload, which also accepts model settings. You know? So there you can do a lot more stuff. You know? So uh, I'm not sure if I can find it quick, quickly, but uh, I think uh, I think something like this you'll find probably the uh, the settings here somewhere somewhere around here you'll find the complete specification of all, everything that's uh, that's uh, possible. <laughs> yep already people are also commenting about ways that they see it to uh, to be used so good feature good add to the product thank you so uh let's move on to to uh to the final feature that i want to show and while showing you showing it to you maybe i will also touch a bit on this uh, two on this two on the uh, action uh, number in workflows and also the dependency tree. So um, 
let me clean up my windows so I can easily find my way around. So here in the entity screen, and I will start with that, we created the webinars and maybe let's quickly create another, uh, another uh, entity. Let's call it maybe participants. Okay, and then uh, just maybe a name and an email for now. And uh, save, oh, let me choose a name property and uh, save and let's uh, let's tell um, the webinar that it needs to have a list of uh, a, a list of participants so again we'll add a property and then from the list of entities types we'll select list of participants so i'm saving this and now uh, what i wanted to show to you and this become more useful when you have bigger data structures so if you go to this uh, tree we changed a bit how this tree was generated before it was a tree with everything and now it's a tree that uh, that is only uh, only references the entity that you clicked you know? so in this case i clicked on the webinars and then we can see uh, entities that the webinar references and of course, we have another, another one that it would have shown here, entities that reference webinars back. You know? So basically, instead of seeing the whole tree, which, which was cumbersome and big and difficult to read, now you only see what's related to the, to the webinar entity I clicked. I can switch focus directly in here. So I can go, to, if I hover participants and I click this icon, it makes participants the central piece you know? so now i can see the other thing entities that refer participants you know? so webinar is using participants you know? so uh, i think we still have uh, a, a bit of uh, let's say ui ux to do here uh, we are thinking about changing the javascript library that we use here to make it uh, to make it uh, nicer to see but the idea here is to see only the direct uh, relationships and be able to navigate quickly uh, around it of course go back you are back to the list and you can start again from any other entity that you want okay uh, so yeah that's one of the of the features uh, of the small enhancements and also on the workflows uh, i mentioned that we added some uh, capabilities for debugging so let's say we we do a simple action a send email action <clears throat> Okay. Uh, first of all, it will uh, it will tell you the type of action because this one uh, this one we could change. We could say no, notify admins. No. Uh, let's let's say I will I will send an email to myself that uh, that there is an error. We'll use this workflow in the next stage. Uh, you know, so there is there is an error and so. On. um so now you see my 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 action sends notify emails you know? uh, say, uh i should have given it a better name let me rename let's call it handle errors okay so um so you see we have a action is called notify admins but what type of action is this no, is it a SMS, a push notification? No. In next versions, we want to make it more obvious, even from this screen. Maybe by the icon, we are still discussing, but at least you can uh, you can double click it and see at a glance that this is a send email and it has ID one. And again, if you look at the error log, sometimes you'll see there was an error in this action with ID twenty three. You know, and this makes a good connection to know to to know and look for it and things like that. So a small enhancement, but I think very useful when debugging. And uh, the other thing, and I think I will still have 10 minutes to talk about what's coming. Uh, the other thing, again, it's a simple, very simple thing, very simple to configure, but uh, I think very, very powerful. So uh, in the automation slash uh, the scheduler part, we added a new type of trigger. So I'm creating a new job and then in the triggers, in the app events, we added this app error event. So this is invoked. Uh, this is invoked uh, when, whenever there's an error on a page, 
uh, if you know sometimes uh, when you get an error it redirects to default aspx uh, and something in query string and uh, also dnn uh, shows that as a 200 okay page you know so that makes it really difficult to use external services to check for errors as well you know uh, but when that happens this trigger will fire you know? so this trigger will fire and will tell you uh, some tokens with about the error that happened you know? and then of course you could use this to to uh, se uh, send it on email we could work call that workflow but of course uh, uh, we didn't configure it with the input so I don't think it's valuable but I could uh, I could just copy paste this and then I'll put it in a body you know and that's it I send an email to myself every time the, the website has an error and then I could it has potential potentially two two major benefits one is that of course you are the first to know if the website goes down for some reason there's always reasons why why, why software breaks out of a sudden but also sometimes there are errors that happen for some users you'll never see those you say oh it works <laughs> you you think it works no but for some users it doesn't work because of some uh, let's say either a design issue or code implementation issue things like that or a particular configuration with their system things like that this email you'll get in both cases you know so then you, you know that maybe 10 percent of your users have a problem you know and then you can act on it so uh it's uh, it's uh, it's a small thing but uh, i think a huge impact cool so um this uh this uh these are the major highlights in in uh, in this release i hope you liked uh, you like them uh let's see oh, Don, before you go on there is a question I, I don't know if you can address it here or we'll address it in the next one but talking about in that uh 116 the change log uh there was one breaking change that was listed I wonder if you can uh, know anything more about that and beyond that just uh, a general question about whether they, they can dig into the details of what a particular change uh, is listed in the change log uh i think uh, in particular that breaking change i think that's uh, that's something that we carried over from from the previous re release from the 115 uh, but in general uh, i'm not sure if you can dig uh, if you can dig into this change log i don't think we expose that information but many of these things will will uh, reach the documentation you know so we, we already have internal documentation on how to configure this that will will make its way to the learn portal you know so many of these will uh, will uh, make it out into various places this one the minimum maximum uh, supported versions will make it uh, will make their way towards the dependencies uh, and things like that the bugs probably will be will be the toughest one to to uh, document exactly. yeah. I'm thinking that maybe we can link it at some point to some community portal or uh, things like that where they uh, where they originated. Very good. I'm sure just you know administrators like to know what they're getting when they click that button for the one click upgrade. Yeah. Very good. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so coming up to the the current release that we are working on, uh, one seventeen uh with the major objective that we we took is to launch the uh, free plan and have app templates for it uh our target is to have one app template to start with but uh, once we have one we can iterate out more receive community contributions as well on on app templates so this is uh, this is a huge milestone for us it's under development uh, the beta will be available uh, on november 3rd that's our plan will take uh, two weeks for for uh, doing the beta testing uh, running uh, all the uh, regression testing and then releasing two weeks uh, later um what i the screenshot that i put here is is from our design and i think this screen in particular is um, already implemented it's uh, the work on this is done this is the first screen that people see when they uh, uh, when they arrive in a new application no. So instead of uh, instead of seeing a blank screen, they will see this screen. Some customization. Hello, uh, first name. You know, some uh, some kind of customization here. How do you want to plant an app? We are playing with the words here uh, with our branding. But then you have these three options. You know, previously you'll start directly from scratch, so you'd see nothing. Uh, you'd start building incrementally. 
Uh, and we've added two new options. I'll start with the last is the from tutorial. And this is the local academy, which I know uh, most of you already uh, already know. Uh, so then you can start uh, for new, especially for newcomers, they can go start the academy and then they can start uh, following the tutorials to build an app. But the interesting options is, uh, is the one in the middle that we are heavily working on, which is to start from a template. And basically what we are doing, we are pointing to a Git repository and pulling the configuration, the entire configuration from that Git repository as a new application. Uh, for this first template, it will probably be the exact same app that we have in the local academy, which is the incident management uh, system. But uh, this uh, this opens uh, this opens a huge uh, door to to bring in various templates from the community, from from the team, from 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 anyone that wants to publish them. Especially because we'll all also add, uh, uh, let's say, a a import from a GitHub URL. So then you can start having your own uh, your own private repositories to not start from scratch when you start a new system. So uh, this uh, this is a big milestone for us, but it's part of a bigger plan that we have, which is to improve improve the developer experience. We focus on improving the first time developer experience currently, but we'll we'll keep uh, extending on that. And I see a question a question in the chat regarding Bootstrap, and I think that's a very good question. If we are going to upgrade it, in fact, it's uh, right now uh, in our internal conversation. It will be the goal for the next release for one eighteen. You know, so that's when we want to revamp all the UI libraries as well to bring them to to Bootstrap five. You know, so that's uh, uh, as we are talking now. That appears to be the next big thing after we launch this one. Of course, uh, for us, developer experience is a big subject. It's not just about UX, you know. So to find things easily, do things fast. It's also about the debugging experience, you know. Just uh, knowing uh, where where does a workflow break, you know. Exactly. That's that's part of what we see as developer experience. The error logs, the messages that you see in error logs, that also a a part of our, our developer experience because if the error tells you exactly where to do and what to fix, that's ideal instead of uh, giving you a vague uh, indication and then you have to figure it out by yourself. But we'll address a lot of UX and UI uh, glitches as well. So I would say I'm just in time. <laughs> Let's see uh, if there are uh, any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Anybody is composing the question, I'll just say as you're talking about 117, I, lo I love that we're getting organized to the point that we're targeting particular dates for beta and release and people will know what's coming next uh, and, and when to plan for. So, uh, and I know you're having an ongoing conversation about beta uh, as well. People who are interested in, in helping to make the product better for themselves and, and for the community, that's, that's a, uh, a great thing that we're working on coming up. Yes. Uh, cool. Also, maybe you'll notice here some rebranding, you know, some slight changes. I put it intentionally on this slide. A bit of uh, font changes in text, in logos. Uh, also, here you'll see a bit of, of, uh, of changes here and there. We are working a bit to rebrand it, make it uh, cleaner and, uh, and more modern. So uh, that will be coming also soon. Very nice. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I think uh, let me, ah, this was the one. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Chad for giving us the bigger picture of uh, why we are all here. Thanks Dale for, for uh, introducing the, uh, the fixes that we, some of the fixes that we provided in 116. And uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to be here. Hope it was uh, valuable to you and We'll be seeing you again next week, same day, same hour. Bye, everyone.